Hello and welcome to series two of the Guns on Pegs podcast. I hope we can remember how to do this. It's been quite a long time since our last episode. We've got a really cool series lined up, haven't we, Chris? We have indeed. We've we've been doing a bit of planning, George. <laughs> yeah, I know. The last series was a little bit fly by the seat of your pants and make it up as you go along. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, it's been so good. It's been lovely to get responses from people and amazing to see that so many people listen to it. That's kind of not really what we expected when we started doing something during lockdown over a beer and just thought, let's see what happens. Yeah, you've mentioned that we've got a bit more of a, a plan. Do you want to just give people a little bit of a flavour of what coming up over the next few episodes yeah sure so, i mean well series one ended without us telling anyone that it would end <laughs> that's always the, <laughs> the the key to a good series is just sort of leave it hanging uh and then fire up with series two so we had a little chat we thought right that was actually really good fun but we had no agenda whatsoever uh so we thought right let's get some variation in so we've got some themes to each of our episodes uh we've got some really really cool guests lined up i'm so pleased that Literally everyone I asked said yes. Uh, and so we're, we've got some awesome guests. And each one's got this little theme, as I said. And today's episode is the Grouse Shot episode. So we're, we've obviously, we're going through some quarries. We're going through a couple of other little bits and bobs. So see what we've got coming. But uh, I won't give too much away. But uh, when, we, when George and I sat down for a bit of planning, we barely did any planning apart from that. <laughs> and we spent most of the time talking about, can we come up with something cool that we can give away to people? And literally 90% of our planning were, has ended in this little gift, which we have got. And I won't say just yet, it's coming in a minute, but Phil is going to be the receiver of the first gift that we have as part of the new series. So uh, it's quite exciting. And actually, we spent the whole time doing that. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, so I don't know if that uh, sort of was maybe missed slightly. Our special guest this week, Chris, is... Oh, so I've, I've gone and, I've gone and uh, <laughs> dropped the ball straight in. <laughs> you have forgotten how to do it. <laughs> well, look, uh, our guest this week, um, well, I, I've, I've sort of half mentioned, but for those of you that don't know, he is said to have taken five grouse from a single covey. Seriously sharp shooter is the uh, the opening way of putting this. He's the other half to the Duchess of Rutland. And like me, he loves a good party the night before a shoot. So we are absolutely delighted to have with us and be joined by the legendary grouse shot that is Phil Burt. Welcome, Phil. Well, I, I can tell you for a start, I feel rather more nervous than standing on the first drive uh, of a day shooting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is something very new to me. But I'm absolutely, I feel very privileged you've asked me to... Uh, to come on to this and uh yes i can ramble on all day about uh, uh the sport that i've grown up with and loved all my life it, phil it's great to have you with us there's absolutely no need to be nervous i think i uh, we've all experienced those nerves on the, the peg first day of the season first pheasant and the best thing about that is when the first pheasant goes over somebody else and they miss it and that's what you've just experienced with Chris popping up the intro. <laughs> so I think I think you can rest easy from now on. Well, the, the amazing thing about shooting is that, you know, people tend to want to see you miss the bird rather than kill it. They don't like clever dicks on the shooting field. So that first high cock pheasant on a day shooting uh, coming to you. you know, and the thing I always say to it, you know, I don't really want you at the moment. I need to get to, <laughs> uh, something a little bit lower in the bag for a start. Today, today is all about having a having a good chat about uh, the the love of your life, you know, grouse shooting specifically. Uh, really looking forward to having a good chat uh, about that. I've got a question to kick it off. Actually, um, the Guinness Book of Records started after a debate about what Britain's fastest game bird was. I don't know if any of you knew that is exactly where the Guinness Book of Records came from. Uh, it's what started the whole thing. So that debate, which kicked off the book, needs to be answered. Phil, what do you reckon? You know, that's that's a really good question. And, and the amount of times uh, you've given an answer to someone and I think been completely wrong. I mean, I, I'd probably compare a grouse with uh, a black game where the slow wing beat uh, and so often you see black game overtaking a grouse. One would have to say a grouse. Uh, I suppose it all depends how much wind it, uh, it's got over its tail. But yeah. I, I, think, I think it's got to be a grouse, hasn't it? I, I can't think of... Uh, uh, another game bird that possibly uh, resembles probably an English partridge. I don't know. George, what do you reckon? Well, 
it's i mean it seems obvious that it's a grouse doesn't it i mean unless they're talking i mean pigeons are rapid aren't they but i think this is exactly why the guinness record records came out <laughs> it's a golden plover it's golden plover is it yeah well, there interesting. You go. <laughs> funny enough this morning i saw uh, the first lot of golden plover i've seen for some years oh awesome so i'm keen to move on to our favorite uh, addition to the first series of the podcast which is going to be a firm fixture in every future series we ever do yeah i think we're getting to it quicker and quicker with every episode as well because we're desperate to get there <laughs> so phil this feature is what's that you're drinking we want to know what you bought to, uh, to enjoy whilst chatting to us and we want to know a little bit of story about it well i mean the thing is we are we are talking shooting and i can think of nothing better than slow gin and that uh, is a bottle of beaver slow gin um, absolutely delicious fox denton actually produce it for us although we do actually produce some ourselves in smaller quantities but i think for a day shooting the standard drink that comes at 11s as should be a slow gin and i should have thought it probably covers 75 percent of the drinks that people have is a tipple of slow gin well i couldn't agree more because I am also drinking slow gin. <laughs> well done. It's also my own brand. It would normally, I'd normally be running quite low in supplies by this time of year because we'd normally have had three out of our four shoot days. <laughs> <laughs> but this year, obviously, we've only had one. So I've still got quite a lot of it here. And I just thought, what better occasion? I haven't had a chance to really try it this year. I love the process of going out each autumn and picking the slows and, and making my own batch one of these years i'll make enough (laughs) yeah i've actually done that uh, this year for the first time you know the fruits this year are phenomenal i've never seen slows plums whatever it is uh i've never seen fruit like it and so i have produced quite a bit of my own slow gin and uh hopefully leave it down for a year or two years some early tasting of it i can tell you is absolutely delicious and i hadn't got a clue what i was doing So a mixture between vodka and gin, uh, separately, actually. Um, And, yeah, they're absolutely delicious. And I think it's something very special when you produce it yourself. My other half and I were out picking slows last weekend. And we only, we spent the whole time on one bush. And we still didn't even get off that. We didn't even make a dent. I couldn't believe the amount of crop. It's remarkable. Why is that? Is that because of the real early sort of summer we had? It's obviously a climate thing, isn't it? And Yeah. uh, you know, some years you get en- enormous amounts of fruit and, and some years not. But I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. So, yeah, it's just that the weather pattern has obviously created this for us. So how much how much slow gin do you get through at, at, at the shoot, Phil, in the course of a season, do you know? <laughs> well, I suppose 120 days uh, you get through, <laughs> get through quite a bit. I mean, one's got to be very careful uh, over drinking on a day shooting. But I actually call it something else. I actually call it a swing corrector. Uh, and, <laughs> and the amount of people that are slightly nervous, particularly on the first drive or after the first drive, and they've shot quite badly, there's nothing like a little tipple of slow gin and the confidence then just... And I, I do that, actually. You know, if I'm a little bit nervous for a start, a little tipple of slow gin, I can tell you, it works wonders. Yeah, I, I, I must agree, uh, even though obviously it's quite a dangerous one to talk about drinking and shooting, but a little bit at, right at the start, I do, yeah. I do agree. Uh, when, when you're paying numbers at the bottom of a, uh, of a glass that you can't see through, that's always a cracker. Yeah, yeah, I quite agree. I quite agree. Chris, what are you drinking? I've set the bar incredibly low for future episodes. Uh, this is the worst beer you can buy. It's a Tenants Super Strong. The reason I'm drinking a Tenants Super Strong is because when I shot my first stag, we were down in the larder on the west coast of Scotland and we're in the game larder sorting out the deer that we'd shot that day. And, you know, the gillies were like, all oh, right, there's a, there's a cold beer in the corner, just go and grab one of those. And naturally, <laughs> it was a Tenants Super Strong. And that beer tasted incredible because it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> Except it really didn't matter what I was drinking. <laughs> And having just had my first sip of Attendant Super Strong since that day, I can tell you it is awful stuff. <laughs> well, perhaps that's all there was. Uh, but funny enough, with a, with a pint of beer, of whatever it may be, whether it's Tenant Super Strong or what, I think the greatest pint comes after a day's grouse shooting again. Uh, and you call at the pub on the way back, should we have a quick pint? 
and it's just that wonderful celebration of having a great day and a pint in the village where you're staying is second to none. I love that. I love that moment, you know, standing up at the bar with everyone after your day's shooting or even before the night before I wrote about that in our uh, member newsletter this week. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, no question. I mean, the look, it's not all about the shooting. Uh, and that's the thing people do miss out. It's meeting up with your pals, whether it's in the pub, the hotel or what it is. And, and that trip away is quite special. And uh, that pint of beer at, at the bar, whether it's just after the, uh, the shooting or whether you're meeting the evening before you're shooting, is quite special. Especially the shoot lodge you've got. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think it matters where you are. Uh, the shoot lodges of all shapes and sizes and uh, various luxuries. But as uh, long as you've got your mates with you and a pint of beer or a slow gin, it doesn't matter where I am. Yeah, indeed. Here, here. Right. Now, Phil, this is the point where we're going to start putting you to work with our new feature for this series. And hopefully it will become as as, uh, as much of a fixture as what's that you're drinking. Now, this feature is called Whose Bird Is It Anyway? And the way it works is we are asking our listeners to send in their shooting dilemmas. We will then pick one from all the submissions each episode, read one out. And then between Chris, myself and our guest each week, we are going to decide what the correct course of action is. So the name obviously comes from that uncertainty when you're on the peg of not knowing whether a bird is yours or your neighbours and potentially putting your foot in it by upsetting your host, shooting his birds or whatever it might be. So this one is one that we have been sent by somebody we're calling Andrew. Well, obviously, we're keeping everybody anonymous to uh, protect their uh, their identity and, and not blow their cover. So this is one that we were sent having mentioned this new feature to a few listeners uh, in passing. So it reads, guys, I need your help. I've been invited to shoot at an incredibly smart estate in the West Country by an old friend of mine later this season. Most of my shooting is pretty low key and I don't often get the chance to shoot at places like this. However, the date of the invitation happens to be my other half's birthday. I'm sure I don't need to spell out the dilemma for you. What should I do? <laughs> Very good. If you and I disagree on this, George, Phil ends up with a casting vote. <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, f I'm gonna I'm gonna steal I'm gonna steal one here and say that. Uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think you can go. I don't think you can. I'm saying that because if my other half listens this is this podcast, then I'm in a good books, aren't I? <laughs> the, the point is, you don't mean it. <laughs> Yeah. I, I thought you had to tell the truth all the time. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure I can speak honestly. George, what do you reckon? <laughs> well, I was, I was wondering, I don't know if the other half shoots or not, but surely the, the, the really diplomatic thing to do would be to offer the peg to your other half and then a tender's loader. Providing you knew she didn't shoot, that's fair enough. I think probably I, I, would, be, I would be shooting and then... Uh, probably the next birthday present would have to be extra specially good. <laughs> they say it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Yeah, I think that <laughs> that that's your key takeaway, George, isn't it? I think that just needs to be the one-liner back to, uh, was it Andrew? Or we're calling him Andrew. Yeah, exactly. I think that needs yeah. to be the one-liner back to this 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 chat. Uh, better to ask for, ask for forgiveness. So that's the official guns on pegs line, is it? Is... <laughs> <laughs> oh dear that's... shoot now and ask for forgiveness later i think Correct. so go on andrew go for it yeah good well i'm glad we put that one to bed i think i think we'll need an update later in the year to find out how her birthday was <laughs> if he's still alive so uh i've got an announcement off the back of that i alluded to it at the start so andrew and Phil are the the first recipients of our new prize, as it were, for being featured on the podcast. So we have managed to get, courtesy of the Shooting Sock Company, our very own bespoke garters. And they are the most exclusive garters you can get. You can only get these if you've featured on the Guns on Pegs podcast. 
can I just be clear that we're talking shooting sock garters here <laughs> and not lingerie? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, didn't you think Phil Phil would want some lingerie rather than garters? Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so these garters are a very specially chosen, outlandish set of colours. Um, they're a deep pink, a navy, and an oatmeal all mixed into one. So they're a deep pink strap and a navy and oatmeal tassels. So they're quite garish, but they're going to be noticed from afar. So if you ever see someone wearing these garters, you know that they've got a story to tell. Either they were a guest on the podcast or they had a confession, and it might be that they were anonymous and therefore you know they had a confession so you can ask them. Or they were a sharer of the pod through to other people in the shooting world because they've, they've told their mates about about the podcast. Yeah, so that's, that's the other way you can get hold of these garters, isn't it? Is by um, So each after each episode goes out, we want you guys to email us and it's the same email addresses for your stories, which is pod at gunsonpegs.com. Email us and the most sort of exotic or outlandish or impressive sharer of after oh each my. episode will also <laughs> receive a set of garters. And then the other thing I thought might be quite interesting, Chris, this occurred to me since our planning meeting is just to let people get people to let us know like what they're doing when they listen to our podcast, where they are in the world, I know that uh, my brother's girlfriend, for example, hi Georgia, uh, she listens to it while out running, which is mad. But um, so, I, I, yeah, I just thought it'd be really interesting to know what how people are listening and and what they're doing when they're listening. I think I, good idea. So exactly that. Uh, those who share it, those who send in their confessions and dilemmas, uh, if they're picked, you get yourself an awesome set of money cannot buy garters that can live with you forever. Wow. <laughs> What's the email address again? Tell everyone. Pod at gunsonpegs.com. Cool. There we go. So, should we move on? We should. Right. Phil, you're here because this is the grouse shooting special, the grouse shot special. Now, I mentioned on the podcast before, I have never actually seen a grouse alive, I don't think. So, I would like you to, as it were, sell it to me. What is it about grouse shooting for somebody who's never experienced it, has only ever seen pictures, what is it that makes it so highly sought after? Well, I think it's number one, it's a wild bird. Uh, and it's it's a quite magnificent bird living in extreme conditions to from the north of England to the, the north of Scotland. And, you know, living in extreme conditions, weather conditions, uh, I find it remarkable. They're also very good parents. And when you think they're bringing chicks up in the wild, their motherly instincts are quite phenomenal. But I think as much as anything, why look, a grouse is something that has to be the most difficult. It's turn of speed. It follows the contours. One minute you're getting them coming high off a sort of mountainside, and the next minute they're cutting up to you low. You get every single kind of shot. I just find it... Uh, as a, for a skill factor, uh, they can undo you completely. I mean, they're difficult enough on a still day. When you get wind behind them, crosswinds, whatever have you, they can fight upwind and the next one's coming downwind. It's just extremely difficult. I just find them, yeah, king of the game bird. I can't think anything uh, apart from probably an English partridge compares to uh, it. I agree, I agree, Phil, entirely. And I suppose also um, the scenery of when you're shooting grouse just so kind of different to most other shooting that we do. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, you're looking again, the extremes of Scotland with the mountains and, and shooting grouse, at, you know, up to two and a half thousand feet. It's, it's countryside that you really can't believe. And uh, a lot of these moors now, particularly in Scotland, opened up by, you know, wealthy <clears throat> businessmen wanting to put their fortune into the nature of grouse moors. And, I, I've seen s such unbelievable stories, and particularly the Angus Glens, a friend that has a moor up there, uh, you know, 100 miles of beautiful roadways that uh, give access onto the moors. You know, the bracken, clearing of bracken, the habitat uh, created for not just grouse, but uh, all the other wading birds. I think a lot of the anti-feeling uh, to grouse is uh, perceived with a um, sort of the wealthy man in his Range Rover heading up into a butt to shoot big numbers. That is not the case. 
And believe you me, I mean, I've had extremes of grouse. I've walked up and we've shot two or three brace and sometimes we've shot a few hundred brace. It's not about the bag. It's being in a grouse butt. And it's the greatest privilege anyone could be given. Uh, do do you ever feel disappointed when you're on a hurdle instead of a nice old stone butt? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good point, but not really, no. I mean, one prefers to be in a butt, obviously, uh, and it's part of it. I mean, this particular friend had had six stone masons on his moor for 10 years, built rebuilding stone butts. I mean, and they're quite beautiful, uh, either circular or square. But a hurdle is always a bit disappointing. Um, and as much as anything, uh, the sort of the safety mm. angle uh, of hurdles is quite a bit more tricky because when you have your sort of uh, sticks in, you, you can't have a rear stick in, uh, which an inexperienced gun might start his swing a little bit too soon because that stick's not there. And I think that was one of the greatest things. They never used to use them, but in the last 10 years, it's compulsory, and so it should yeah. be. You know, there's a thing called butt spin. You know, when the grouse are really coming to you, you know, you're going forward, back, and it's always a fatal to tr turn around when there's a lot of grouse coming. But when you do get turning forward and back, it's very easy to lose your line, uh, where your line is. And But the, the fact the pegs are there has made grouse shooting... A hundred yeah, times so true. safer. So true. So, well, you're, you're actually, you've moved into the next question I was going to ask you quite nicely. Your top tips for shooting grouse. So actually, let, let's imagine George here. So George has got first day and, and me who seriously needs some brushing up. But uh, <laughs> but uh, for our listeners out there who who, uh, who maybe want to get a bit better or have never shot grouse before, what, what are your top tips? What are the things you really need to remember? Well, they always say uh, for one of the main things is you're too late. Uh, and getting onto them in front. Uh, and I always think, for me, one of the, if it's a sort of normal breezy day, sometimes when it's a gale and they're coming over a gill, you can't use both guns. But there should always be time to use both guns into a cubby. And let's call a cubby of 10 or 15. Uh, and as they're coming uh, to you, you still should have time for your fourth barrel. Uh, so perhaps two or three shots in front and one behind. Um, I would expect if you if you can't do that, you're too late with that first shot. Um, we had a team once, a very inexperienced team was uh, up in the Derby, up in the Peak District, and they were really struggling with the grouse. And they said, "Look, look Phil, you know what what are we doing wrong?" I said, "What you've got to do, you've got to start soon. You're leaving them till they come round the butt." Well, of course, the next drive, I, I noticed one of the guns shooting approximately 200 <laughs> yards with his first shot. And so I had to go and say to him, look, I, I didn't really mean that far in front. Um, uh, so, yeah, you, you've got to give yourself time. And that first shot, the first kill, hopefully, uh, you know, and it's always then surprising. You think it's a long way out in front, but when you come to pick it up, sometimes it's only about 10 or 15 yards in front of your butt. So... You can never be soon enough, really. For an experienced shot, yeah, you've got to get stuck so, in. So how, how far out in front do you feel? I mean, is it is it put totally dependent on the conditions or do you feel that there is always a sort of distance? What, what, yeah, I mean, as a yardage, I can't really put on probably 50 yards. But don't forget that the lead is meeting the bird coming towards you. It's not like the fact it's gone through the line because a fast bird going through the line... Um, <coughs> It's, it's soon over the horizon and uh, possibly some of the shots going off are 50, 60, 70 yards behind because it's heading away from you. So the impact of your shot with a grouse coming at you, of course, is much so greater. For somebody making, for, you know, our, our theoretical first time grouse shot, who's probably done a fair bit of pheasant and partridge shooting. What are the the differences in sort of I don't know thought processes and and maybe setup and that kind of thing that you might be thinking about that that you would say to somebody on the morning of their first day? Yeah, I mean, I, I always think as well, foot positioning is is pretty important. You know, your gun is, wherever your feet go, your gun is is sort of following it. And I say that particularly because let's take a grouse behind. People shuffle round to shoot a grouse behind rather than get turned round, but particularly when the hoot has gone, for instance, you face your back to the bird coming and then your feet are in the right position to shoot it behind you. 
um, because shuffling around and trying to pull the trigger at the same time is not the answer to shooting a grouse behind. That's where people tend to go wrong with a bird behind. I mean, in front, it's coming at you. Your feet normally in the right position uh, and, and you shoot whether you kill it or not. So that's one of the great things of, with shooting behind. Get yourself turned round, get your feet in the right position to take your second gun or, or, or as I say, when the hoot has gone and you can't shoot in front, get yourself right, just a very short, quick swing behind, your feet are in the right position, pull the trigger. And the <laughs> uh, going back to the uh, the shooting in front and shooting miles out in front, I'm, I imagine you've got uh, some 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 birds in your mind, memories of, of particular shots. I, I, I think you, you, when you were saying that, it reminded me of, a, a, well, lucky enough to shoot a few days, gra- driven grass in my life, but I remember shooting one out in front. I thought I was letting off the trigger really, really early. And it, it was on a, it was a real blowing gale coming straight into our faces. So obviously the speed these birds were doing was just, you know, uncomprehendable. And I pulled the trigger miles out in front and this thing just folded, landed so far behind me. <laughs> I yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> I was I was absolutely blown away. I yeah. remember thinking, "My God, this is just pot luck." Uh, but you just got to be so quick. Yeah, I had I had one one that sticks in the mind. Not a high grouse. I, I, mean, I was shooting at Leonard with uh, uh, Lord yeah. James, uh, and uh, uh, there was a grouse coming towards me, and, and a single grouse, and over. Literally in the rise and three more were coming. So I'd, I'd sort of got it in my mind to try and ping the first one out and then probably change and go into it. But anyway, I fired the, sh- at the, sh- the shot at the close one, close-ish one coming in. And the other, they looked to be 100 yards away. And it killed the dead one. It killed the, the, the close one and the middle one behind it which looked 100 <laughs> yards away so it must have been a, a stray pellet and i don't think ever i've shot a grouse further than that in front of me. but it, I, i'll never forget it, it shows you what you could do there doesn't it doesn't it just yeah doesn't it and 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 that's it with grouse shooting. the other thing is when when there are a lot of grouse and you're shooting double guns and you're shooting quickly you tend to start to shoot further out in front because there's not time to wait for it if you like because there's more following it and you tend to get into a wonderful rhythm. And once you get a, a line on them, you know, uh, you really can hopefully make quite a good job of it. But it's that relaxation, not just that one possible shot you might get. If you get 20 or 30 shots plus, uh, you tend to get into a rhythm. You, you'll have seen a lot of very good grouse shots in operation. Is there anything that sort of uni- that unites all the best grouse shots about the way that they shoot? I think it's um, a lot of it is that very relaxed way they stand in a butt. And there are some great grouse shots. But I think if, if I was going to pick anyone, it would probably have to be Simon Ward. You know, he's got a reputation uh, beyond him. I always pull his leg and say he just takes the easy one. <laughs> and, and, but, but I always fire twice as many cartridges as he does. But uh, he is very relaxed, very deliberate and pretty much on the on the beak every time it's quite annoying really apart from that yeah there are some wonderful grouse shots uh, about and um and i think they love it because it is the most difficult of all game birds you, you see people shooting well you see people shooting like uh, quite a few birds and low ratios and whatever but it's the people who are constantly killing them in the head that you really notice on a day i think that's the that's the true mark and there must be some more people you mentioned simon who, who else springs to mind well, of course, you know, you can't not mention George Digweed. I mean, uh, uh, George is the size of a tank, uh, uh, but uh, just such a wonderful shot and it, it just extreme birds, you know. Um, I mean, these boys, uh, they tend to shoot with over and unders, probably quite heavily choked and probably quite heavy cartridges. And I don't think there's a lot of problem about it, but, you know, where uh, many of us shoot with si- side by sides with 28 gram. Uh, cartridges, you know, because it knocks us about too much. They are professional in every respect. Make no mistake, you know, George is not 24 times world champion for the hell of it. Yes, some clay shots aren't as as good on grouse than than they might be, but it's a different discipline. But the likes of George, Simon Ward, Richard Foles, I shoot with a little bit. You know, the the top clay shots really can can shoot. Um, But 
as real game shots, perhaps the Percy boys, you know, wonderful to watch. And there is this sort of slight snobbery about cyber sides. I'm going to mention Yeah, it because, I was going to ask uh, you. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, and then people do ask me, oh, yeah, I suppose you've got, no, no, I'll shoot the cyber side. That's part of the tradition uh, that we've grown up to be. And, and you know, I, I feel I was halfway towards an automatic if I picked a, uh, an over <laughs> and under up. But... I'm going to get crucified for that if they say it, but, but that's the way I that's the way I feel a little bit. You know, it's uh, being a bit of a purist. Well, totally with you, Phil. I think uh, I stand in the butt and I put my lovely little side by side over the over the front with a bit of heather. I just think I think the whole thing just feels right. I don't know why. I can't really explain it. It's just something you love, and uh, standing there, and also I think certainly it's the style of shooting grouse with a side by side, it just lends itself much much better for me. Uh, using a side by side than an over and under. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's a very traditional thing. You know, I wouldn't think there was a, hardly an over and under used in uh, decades ago on, on the grouse moors. They're very much uh, the hand of down purdies from uh, fathers and grandfathers that would, you know seem to be used on a on a moor. But it is amazing now. And I think is it easy to use an over and under? I'm not sure it is. I think the skill factors there. I mean. Uh, and then a, a friend of mine, David Flux, brilliant shot, uh, always uses these wretched 28 boards, which is infuriating. Uh, <laughs> but he'll shoot as well as anyone. Uh, and the likes of Nick Bakey and, uh, um, I, you know, I could go on. but And someone will watch this and say, well, what about me? You didn't mention me. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, there's, there's some great shots there. Uh, and, but great people, you know. I mean, just wonderful to be with. Absolutely. So to, uh, thinking about grouse moors themselves, are there any particular moors where uh, you think they deserve a sort of shout out for everything they've done or the, the most beautiful places, that the, the, you know, the best places you've I been? I mean, one of the most incredible moors, I did briefly mention it earlier on, would, would be Mill Den. And uh, the work that's gone into that moor, totally void of grouse, pretty much. Uh, I think I uh, shot about 20 brace the first year. Uh, there were, the black game had gone, uh, the wildlife had gone, and in the period of 10, 15 years that uh, Dick Hansen has had it, he has resurrected wildlife to a point that you can't believe. The black game now come over in coveys, and the grouse have built back to an average of probably 5,000, 6,000 brace. He's going to get hiccups, but it was riddled with louping eel, uh, tick galore. He took the... Um, the all the sheep back in hand after about three or four years. So they run them as, as they're known as sheep uh, tick mops. Um, and the louping eel disappeared. And it's quite phenomenal now that every bird, whether it be grouse or otherwise, um, fit and healthy and doing extremely well. It's phenomenal to see it. And uh, I take my hat off to Dick wanting to spend his money creating yes he's creating a shoot and pe people don't like that but look at the wildlife side of it and it's it's as i say it's only the it's only the grouse moor owners that are keeping wildlife uh, keeping wildlife going it's so it's so good to hear and i i couldn't agree more i mean obviously as shooting people we kind of know this and it's the un, it's the sort of I suppose we refer, refer to it sometimes as the untold story, but that's because other people don't want to talk about it so much. But we we know that what's going on at many of these moors is just absolutely fantastic. And unfortunately, it's, you know, the occasional bad bit that, that only gets spoken about. It's such a shame. Really. Exactly. There's another moor in, in Dumfries that uh, some friends bought in the early 60s. And that was a beautiful little moor, very near Crafell. And, you know, we used to shoot 30 or 40 brace of walk up grouse on it there was no keeper on it they did a bit of burning themselves a bit of vermin killing that was then sold off in for forestry and i visited the moor some 40 years later and we climbed up through 40 year old softwood um, firs uh, to the very top of it and we walked i just wanted one more time to walk that moor it was so exciting for me having just shot 300 brace at uh, lead hills the day before <laughs> We walked the moor for 10 hours and we came back with a brace and a half of grouse and totally desolate. I saw one buzzard and uh, one little lot of grouse, which we shot a couple out of. So that's a tragedy to me. The most beautiful place overlooking the Solway, completely destroyed by forestry. 
but I know now there's, a, there's an awful lot more to it and, and these grouse moors have suddenly become very valuable and in heavy demand. So th- uh, most memorable days ever, I'm really keen to know. Uh, the ones that really stick in your mind and why? Well, um, I've had quite a few, of course. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think a lot of people ask me, what's the most favourite moor I've shot on? I think, I think 90 different moors uh, I'd roughly worked out that I'd been on, which is the most uh, wonderful privilege. That's a stab in the eye for you, George, because you haven't shot one yet. <laughs> a call now. Another way that you can win a pair of these garters is by inviting me grouse shooting. All <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, right. Will... Yeah, yeah some, just some quite incredible days. It's normally actually in a gale. And uh, funny enough, we, we uh, 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 Duke and Duchess, uh, uh, here... Uh, and myself bought a, 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 blo- a, more, a more in the Peak District last year. One of the greatest days I had was on the first year, and um, we shot it on December the 2nd in a howling gale, five of us, killed 108 brace. I don't think I can remember, in a gale, and it was, the snow was driving at us, um, and since then the grouse have crashed. Uh, nothing to do with that day, but, you know, how fine things are. We'd, we'd reckon we were going to double our grouse numbers the next year, and uh, they, they literally, with heather beetle, drought, too much rain at the wrong time. We're now in our running in, we've just had our fourth year, very disappointing. But it, it will come back and we're, we're doing everything in our powers uh, to get it back. But plenty of other days, you know, uh, there's a little more that uh, David Flux has at Snailston. That was always one of my favourite moors. Unbelievably, the most difficult grouse. Sally Grain, I think, was one of the one of the drives. Then fish houses, grouse in extreme. One minute down, and the next minute up. Probably that's where Scotland comes in. The topography is even even more uh, steep, and then you get a, a, a different sort of grouse. Every grouse that comes is flying in a, in a different way. So, oh, there's so many days that's been memorable. I think I love them all and I love every grouse moor and every grouse moor I go on is a privilege. So I wouldn't like to say one moor is better than the other. I just have been very lucky. Very diplomatic though. Well, <laughs> well I might not get an invitation from one of them. <laughs> that leads quite nicely though, I think, to the way that I think it'd be quite nice to round off each of these uh, episodes for the next series, which is, Again, you can tell that uh, coming up with original titles isn't necessarily our forte. We've called this one Desert Island Shooting. <laughs> so th- th- this goes back to our planning. How long was our planning meeting, George? It was about 45 yeah, minutes. Just... And, and we spent 40 minutes talking about garters. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what was it again? De- Desert Island? Desert Island Shooting. It's, it's no rip-off of Desert Island Discs at all, is it? I mean... <laughs> so so yeah it's 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 talking about you need to come up with phil if you could have one last day's shooting and you can be as elaborate and as ridiculous as you like with this money is no object it doesn't matter transport's not an object the company people not being free not an object what would that day's shooting look like and by the way you can you can sort of make it into a bit of a weekend if you like the night before where would it be and why wow I think I think actually, I can't think of anywhere better than going to Mill Den. I think it's it it is it's got everything from the lodge to our host's incredible uh, wines to the the most beautifully kept grouse moor, um, and then if you're on off the moor in good time, the Salmon River runs through the garden, so you can flick a salmon out, uh, and if you want to, you can just pop up and shoot a stag. I mean, it's got everything. The team that he has up there is always great fun. And something about it, uh, it's a seven-hour drive, and I've done it really quite often, and I, I get excited every time I go onto that moor. If there's a last day, he's got a drive called Benny Gray, and it's on a steep hillside. And the last twice I've, I've got this, but where they come at literally every angle one minute coming high the next minute low cutting up round the back it's just so exciting and i think that if i had to pick a drive that that would be the one at mill den that uh, i i just love it every time i'm there 
And I make a hash of quite a lot of them as well, I can tell you. It's, it's not all, <laughs> they're not all in the beak, my God. But, um, yeah, that would be the one. So it sounds like Mill Den is like the sort of desert island shoot on this actual yeah. planet, doesn't it, George? I mean, this is a place that's got everything. So we don't even need to sort of make one up. We just go to Mill Den. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got, to, George has got to do that. I mean, uh, um, fortunately uh, for, for some of us that uh, uh, Dick doesn't sell any of his grouse shooting. So <laughs> yeah, might. exactly. Yeah. But it is, it is just it, great, great host, great more, great everything. It's just, it's got everything really has amazing well uh, congratulations to him as well on on everything that you've described in terms of what he's done there and um yeah we love we love profiling places like that because i think that is the the unsung part of of grouse shooting i think that's a cracking place to leave it really i mean you've just got me thinking i mean obviously we've yeah we're, we're in the we're in the sort of mid of november uh we haven't been able to enjoy too much of this at the moment uh and just uh just got me absolutely going for 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 the next days when they come out, even if they're not grouse, obviously, which they're unlikely to be now on. But uh, so exciting! And uh, and our next episode, we have the sporting agent episode. So we're going to be visiting all sorts of different places, different memories, different strange requests that have been had over the time. Uh, we've got a good friend of mine on Mark Firth, uh, who's also a, a fellow trustee of the Country Food Trust. Phil, you must know Mark, mustn't you? I know, I know Mark, and uh, I haven't seen Mark for some time actually, but. Uh, we always had a bit of leg pull, and uh, he was with Roxton's. He started Roxton's. I'm right by saying so. It shows how long ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm right by that, aren't I? Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah. some some years since I've uh, seen Mark. But uh, anyway, uh, he will he will interview. He was always he always had the gift of the gab, <laughs> you know. I mean, uh, and uh, he always said the right things rather than I tend to say the wrong things. But when you, when you see him, uh, send him my very best regards. And uh, yeah, he's a great chap. I will do. We'll do, and we'll we'll be uh, we'll be asking him if he's been to Mill Den because I think that's the, that's the place now, isn't well, it? It is for me. <laughs> well, well I, uh, hopefully he's been there, and then we can ask him. We'll we'll, we'll see what his favourite grass war is as well. But um, look, Phil, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us, and um, yeah, we um, look forward to catching up another time when uh, we've had a bit more of a normal season. And enjoy some more memories. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to do this for you, boys. And uh, I thought it rather more difficult than that. But if I, uh, you know, I failed all my exams over the year. But, you know, being asked questions on shooting, I'm I'm not too bad at that. Uh, But fingers (laughs) crossed, you know, this government, I'm just going to say, this government have got to let us go on the 3rd of December. And they can't stop us until February the 1st. And hopefully the season may be extended for a week or two. Otherwise, we're going to be in a bit of trouble with it. But let's fingers cross they see sense. I do know there's a few influential people at that level that do listen to this podcast, but I think they're already on our side. <laughs> well, f- fingers crossed, because I don't know what we're going to do if it goes wrong. But uh, anyway, great to talk to you. And thanks very much for picking me out. I feel very privileged. It's been great having you, Phil. So all that remains for me to say is to thank everyone who's been listening. Once again, thank you for coming back. I hope we weren't too ropey after our break and hope you enjoyed our first episode. Before we go, there's one final reminder from me that you can get your hands on a pair of these exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters. You can get them by sending us your shooting dilemmas. You can tell us where you've been sharing the podcast. You can tell us where you've been listening or just, you know, send us an email. We don't care. Right. Whatever. So uh, send us an email pod at gunsonpegs.com. Make sure you subscribe. Thanks very much for listening. And Goodbye. Very well done. That was really good fun. I enjoyed it. I've missed doing these. Now.